Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Napoleon's Marshals Part 5. So this is the second to last video in Epic History TV's Napoleon's Marshals series. Uh, I'm very excited to get into this one. You know, the series keeps getting better and better as we go on. I'm a little sad that we're coming to the end, but, you know, I've enjoyed this series a lot so far, and I'm sure I will really enjoy these last two episodes. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I would appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below and has exclusive content. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. Part 5. Here we go. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The classic intro. <laughs> the words inscribed on every French marshal's battle. Hmm. In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. Yep. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals. With expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former chief historian of the French army. And you know, during each video, I've asked you guys about your opinions on their rankings and you know some of you have had divergent opinions you've said that well you would place this marshal here or this marshal here but generally it seems like they did a pretty good job on actually ranking the marshals though of course the whole concept of ranking them in the first place is a difficult one you know who exactly did better than who um but the consensus i'm getting is that though there may be some disagreements Epic History TV did a, a pretty damn good job with their ranking here. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrouille, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Oudinot, Victor, Murat, Bessier, MacDonald, Massena. Some really interesting guys so far. Um, I mean, quite quite a collection of fellows. Poniatowski, he was really fascinating. So was Bernadotte, Marmont, Murat, McDonald, Messina. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting guys here. Um, and some in particular really stand out. I think the ones I just listed definitely stood out to me, but uh, also several more of them. Um, yeah, all of these guys are really interesting in one way or another. Um, and I don't expect that trend uh, to end here. You know, presumably the last six men on this list will be just as interesting as the others. <clears throat> First, a big thanks to our video sponsor, Surfshark. All right, so you guys know the deal. Epic History TV makes some fantastic videos um, that we all enjoy. So I would appreciate it. I'm sure they would too. If you would go to their video, give them a like, subscribe to their channel, check out their sponsor. Uh, you know, their link is on the screen right now. Basically show them some support for making such fantastic content um, that we all enjoy. Epic History for a special offer of 83% off and three months free. Thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Very nice. Six, Marshal Suchet. Suchet. I think a lot of you guys like Suchet. <laughs> I've, I've heard a couple of comments about no one spoiled anything, but uh, a few of you guys definitely seem to like Suchet. <laughs> Louis Gabriel Suchet was born in Lyon, the son of a prosperous silk merchant. Plans mm. to join the family business were derailed by the French Revolution. I mean, you know, I don't want to repeat myself too much because you guys have 
a lot of you guys have watched every video up until this point, but it is worth reiterating once again, uh, a individual from a bourgeois background. Now, that could be someone who came from poverty or someone who came from relative wealth, but at the time, these were mostly, these marshals were mostly middle class bourgeoisie, aka they were not nobility. Like I said, some of them were richer than others, but uh, it's this middle class, this bourgeois class of men that really rise through the ranks during the revolution and under Napoleon. Um, and like I said, I, I do keep repeating myself, but, you know, it's almost every single one of them has been an example of this trend. So I feel it worth to point out at least once a video. <laughs> Suchet, an ardent Republican, joined the cavalry of the Lyon National Guard. In 1793, he was elected to lead a volunteer battalion, and at the Siege of Toulon, distinguished himself by helping to capture the British commander, General oh. O'Hara. He also... Another uh, individual at the Siege of Toulon, where Napoleon really uh, made his name, or one of the earliest moments where Napoleon made his name. Now, we've seen a few of the other marshals who were with Napoleon at that moment, or with Napoleon from rather early on and then followed him all the way up. They made friends with a young Major Bonaparte. Nice. Suchet went on to serve under Napoleon in his first brilliant campaign in Italy, mm. fighting at Lodi, Castiglione, and Bassano. Transferred to Massena's division, he led his battalion with distinction at Arcole and Rivoli, was wounded twice, and promoted colonel. It was in Italy that Suchet learned the most valuable lesson of his career. For troops to be effective, they must be properly paid, clothed, and fed. Something the French Republic consistently failed to achieve. Hmm. Despite proving himself to be an excellent organizer and dependable in battle, Suchet never quite made it into General Bonaparte's inner circle. Hmm. He went on to serve as a highly effective chief of staff to General Brun and then to Massena in Switzerland, and was with Joubert in Italy, who died in his arms at the Battle of Novi. Wow. Suchet was promoted to General of Division. wonder why Suchet never made it to the inner circle. Uh, I mean, to my understanding, Napoleon had a quite small inner circle. You know, he really was choosy about who he let in, so maybe it's that alone. Um, you know, he couldn't have too many people close to him. And in 1800, he was given command of the Army of Italy's left wing. With Massena besieged by the Austrians in Genoa, the defense of southern France fell on his shoulders. In a brilliant independent campaign, he held the Austrians near Nice, then chased them back into Italy, taking 15,000 prisoners. Despite wow. this impressive record, Suchet was not on the list of marshals created by Napoleon in 1804. Worse, in 1805, he was effectively demoted, being given command of a division in Marshal Land's 5th Corps. Wow! Nevertheless, it was a role he performed with great skill. His division distinguished itself at Ulm and Austerlitz. And the next year led the attack in Napoleon's crushing victory over the Prussians. So, I mean, he's struggling to work his way up, but, you know, he seems to display talent and skill, uh, really at every step. So, I mean, clearly he eventually works his way up to Marshall, but it is taking a while. At Jena. The next year in Poland, his division saw hard fighting at Hultusk, mm. but was then held back to defend Warsaw, and missed the great battles of Eylau and Friedland. Napoleon heaped rewards on General Suchet, money, titles, but still no Marshal's Battle. Why? In 1808, Suchet's division was sent to Spain, where he'd spend the next six years. Oh, wow. His first uh -oh. role was to support the Siege of Zaragoza. Then, on Marshal Land's recommendation, Napoleon gave him command of Third Corps and made him governor of Aragon. Now, judging from some of the comments I saw on my last reaction to Napoleon's Marshals, plus the comment that they showed from Napoleon at the beginning of this, uh, it seems like Suchet is going to do a good job in Spain, or at least a better job than his contemporaries. Um, 
which is pretty remarkable because it was a terrible situation for the French. And as I said in a previous video, like, yeah, no one had a good time in Spain. None of the marshals did a good job. We may be about to get the exception to the rule. Suchet found his troops to be poorly supplied, ill-disciplined, and low in morale. Their first battle together against General Blake's Spanish army ended in a humiliating rout at Alcañiz. Suchet found the drummer who'd started the panic and had him shot in front of the entire corps. Oh, wow. He then reorganized his troops and restored discipline and pride with two quick victories over the Spanish. Hmm. I mean, it seems like Suchet was someone who understood uh, logistics and organization, which I think would be a very beneficial skill to have in a situation like this. He also faced a guerrilla war in Aragon, right. a popular insurgency driven by hatred of the French invader. Fair. <laughs> Suchet drew on French experience of fighting counter-revolutionary insurgents in the Vendée mm. and realized that it was only by winning over the civilian population that he'd be able to make progress. Very smart. I mean, that's, uh, that's a very intelligent insight. You know, if you're in hostile territory, all the civilians hate you and are willing to shelter rebels supply rebels or become rebels themselves, you know, uh, men leaving their families to go to the mountains and become guerrillas, then it's kind of a hopeless situation for you. But if you can win the population back to your side, then, you know, the rebels, the guerrillas start to lose supplies, lose recruits, lose places they can stay. Um, so that, that's a very intelligent way of thinking. And for those that don't know, by the way, the Vendée Revolt was a royalist uprising in the Vendée region of France um, that really started up when the revolution really started getting radical and very anti-Catholic, anti-religious. Um, it ended up being brutally suppressed by the revolutionary government. Um, so presumably that's why Suchet is drawing on that, because the government managed to suppress and destroy the Vendée Revolt. He made it his first priority to ensure his own men were properly paid and fed. Mm. Something almost unheard of for French troops in Spain. Smart. He enforced discipline and made sure requisition supplies were paid for. He told his troops, I will look after your well-being, and you by your discipline will give security to the inhabitants. You will make them, by your conduct, mm. care for the government of King Joseph. I mean, it's intelligent. By taking care of the troops, they're going to respect you more. They're going to trust you. They're actually going to follow orders. Um, in addition, if you supply the troops, give them what they need, clothe them, feed them, you know, they may be less inclined to loot, uh, you know, Spanish civilians, which was one of the big issues. Um, now, I mean, regardless, the Spanish were pretty angry at the French occupation, but, you know, the French looting certainly made it much worse. So if you can prevent that, then you might have an easier job of winning the civilians to your side. Still, definitely not an easy job at all, but um, easier than if you're looting and killing them. He told the Spanish people, My troops will not impede your harvests nor overcrowd your cities. They will live in the countryside, ready to protect you. Religion and clergy will be respected. Wow. Crucially. And as we saw in the main series, one of the biggest uh, fears of the Spanish population was that anti-religious aspect of the revolution, which I literally just talked about. You know, the revolution, one of the big parts of it is that it had uh, really attacked the Catholic Church in France. Um, and so you know, fellow Catholic countries like Spain uh, were obviously very not into that. And so the Spanish people were uh, pretty fearful and angry at the revolutionaries. Um, and they worried that, you know, uh, the French would do the same thing in their country, try to destroy the church. Um, and so clearly Suchet is trying to push back against that assumption. Suchet also promised protection from the many Spanish guerrilla bands who behaved no better than bandits. Mm. 
His practical and humane approach won respect and brought results. Nice. The guerrillas could never be completely defeated, but Suchet made Aragon the safest and best-run region in occupied Spain. Yeah, I mean, I think his strategy is probably the best way you could go about it. Now, it was still a bad situation, and like they said, you're never going to completely defeat the guerrillas, but this is probably the best that you can do. And, you know, this was very rare in, uh, you know, the Iberian War. Um, most of the French marshals... French commanders didn't seem to think this way. Um, it, you know, some of them did better jobs than others, but they all really struggled. Um, whereas Suchet, you know, seems to be the best performing out of the lot. <laughs> he extended French control of eastern Spain with a series of successful sieges at Lerida, Mequinenza, and Tortosa. Mm. In June 1811, he took Tarahona. For this victory, Napoleon finally awarded him his Marshal's Battle. Hey, there we go. Earned in Spain. Wow. That, now that's impressive. Like, yeah, he, he won himself a Marshal's Baton. Uh, that's incredibly impressive. Um, how did he get it? By fighting in Spain. Wow, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> you managed to earn the rank of Marshal fighting in what was uh, perhaps the most difficult theater of the war to distinguish yourself in. You know, everybody else, all of his contemporaries were desperately struggling, uh, and he managed to distinguish himself um, to such an impressive degree. Na Napoleon decided, okay, now I'll give him the rank of marshal. You know, very impressive. Then he moved south. He defeated a larger Spanish force at Sacuntum, then took the great city of Valencia, along with 18,000 prisoners and nearly 500 guns. Wow. Napoleon rewarded Suchet with the title Duke of Albufera. But the overall situation in Spain was deteriorating steadily. Yeah. The partisans became better organized and supplied. The British Navy was able to land troops on the coast to make diversionary attacks while Napoleon withdrew more and more units for his own campaigns in Russia and Germany. Mm. After King Joseph and Jourdan were defeated at Vitoria, Suchet had no option but to pull back towards the French frontier. Yeah, I mean, he did a good job, but despite that, the French, you know, were overall not succeeding in Spain. So his individual effort could not prevent the French retreat. But, you know, now I understand Napoleon's quote at the beginning of this section, if he'd had a couple of souches, he might have been able to successfully hold Spain. <laughs> I can, uh, you know, I can see his point. Leaving behind several well-supplied garrisons. Hmm. On Napoleon's abdication, Suchet remained undefeated, still holding Damn. the French frontier. Impressive. When Napoleon returned from exile, Suchet went to meet him in Paris. It was the first time they'd met in person in wow. eight years. Marshal Suchet, you have grown greatly since we last saw one another. <laughs> like physically? <laughs> the emperor told him. He entrusted Suchet with command of French forces in the south. Wow, so this is one of the marshals that uh, uh, rejoined Napoleon, because we've seen a lot of them who, uh, and I would say fairly enough, decided to either stay out of it or fight against him. Uh, Suchet actually rejoined. An important independent command for which few men were better suited. Mm. Suchet dutifully kept France's enemies at bay until news arrived of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo. Mm. Following the second Bourbon restoration, Suchet was dismissed and retired to his country estate where he died in 1826. He was still held in such esteem in Aragon that a mass was held to pray for his soul in the Cathedral of Zaragoza. Wow. I mean, that really shows you that he did a good job. You know, this was a place that he was, he was a foreign occupier. And, you know, his name held that much respect even there. That's a testament to his efforts. 
Suchet was a brilliant commander, widely regarded as the best administrator in Napoleon's army. Yeah, yeah. He was also one of the few who thrived with the responsibility of independent command. Mm. He never had the opportunity to prove himself on the war's decisive battlegrounds. But you know, I think, and this is, seems to be absolutely true from what we've heard of him, you know, administration and logistics are two of the most underrated aspects of warfare, uh, often forgotten or skipped over, yet extremely important to military success, uh, or loss for that matter. Um, you know, you really uh, need good administration and good logistics um, if you want, you know, long-term uh, consistent success, I would say. Uh, and Suchet understood that and was clearly as they said, a very talented administrator. But when Napoleon, in exile on St. Helena, was asked to name his best general, he replied, that is difficult to say, but it seems to me that it is Suchet. Wow. Okay. Um, I can see why Suchet is getting a top six spot. Um, I'm kind of, with all that praise, I'm a little surprised he's not even higher up, but he definitely deserves that spot. Uh, a very talented guy, um, very skilled, very competent, just all around, um, you know, uh, qualified, <laughs> you know, did his job, did it well, did it independently. Um, so definitely deserves that spot. Now we're on to Marshall Ney. Five, Marshall Ney. Good, a classic Napoleon backhand compliment. You know, Napoleon is good at backhand compliments or straight up insults. Um, you know, if this quote is true, then Ney may be, and, you know, I, th I think it is true from what we know of Ney, less well rounded than Suchet. That was one of the best aspects of Suchet compared to some of these other marshals, is that he was incredibly well rounded. You know, he could do every part of the job, whereas some of these guys excel at one part of the job while struggling with others. Michel Ney was a Cooper's son from Lorraine, a German-speaking region of France on mm. the eastern frontier. Yep. His father wanted him to become a clerk, but the young Ney, impetuous and headstrong, joined a Hussar regiment instead. He soon distinguished himself as a fine horseman and fencer, and was a senior sergeant by the time of the French Revolution. Nice. When war broke out, Ney was made an officer, and became aide-de-camp to General La Marche. Mm. His reports describe Ney as active, brave, and a skilled tactician. Ney served in the Netherlands and on the Rhine, fighting at Valmy, Jemat, and near Vinden. He was seriously wounded once and captured once. Wow. Fellow officers nicknamed Ney the indefatigable. His men preferred Le Rougeau, the ruddy or red-faced. Hmm. The 30-year-old Ney was now a proven brigade commander, despite refusing promotion more than once, regarding himself as unqualified. In 1799, following glowing reports from General Bernadotte, he finally accepted the rank of General of Division. In 1800, Ney and his division played a major role in General Moreau's great victory over the Austrians at Hohenlinden. Mm. This brought him to the attention of France's new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte. Hey, there we go. He still never served. When they met in Paris, they warmed to each other. Napoleon entrusted Ney the delicate task of imposing his act of mediation on Switzerland, which he carried out with swift efficiency. Yeah. The same year, Ney married Agli Louise Augier, a friend of Josephine's daughter, Hortense, now Napoleon's stepdaughter, drawing him closer to France's future imperial family. Mm. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed a new empire, and Ney was made a marshal. Wow, so early. Uh, I'm kind of surprised because, I mean, Ney clearly has seen a lot of action and has proved himself militarily, but
but he hasn't served with Napoleon that much. You know, Napoleon has not been witness to many of his feats, yet he was still made a marshal uh, as soon as possible. Interesting. The next year, he was leading 6th Corps to war against Austria. All he right. was accompanied by Colonel Henri Jomini, a Swiss officer and military theorist. Ney had been quick to recognize his talent, giving him a job as his aide-de-camp and helping to publish his work. Nice. Jomini would win fame as one of the 19th century's great military thinkers and served Ney well as his chief of staff on several campaigns. Good to have him along then. <laughs> During the advance against the Austrians, Jomini encouraged Ney to ignore orders from Marshal Murat <laughs> that would have allowed the enemy to escape. Their decision was vindicated when 6th Corps won a brilliant action at Elchingen that closed the trap on General Mack's forces at Ulm. Well, and that, that's the delicate balance with acting independently or taking the initiative without being told to. You know, if it goes badly, then it's all on you. You know, you're the one that messed up. But if it goes well, then it's also all on you. You know, the... Uh, the praise goes to you. You acted independently, you thought of this on your own, and you succeeded. That really um, contributes to your reputation, um, to how others view you, right? But you need to make sure that it goes well, or you're in big trouble. Ney's corps missed the Battle of Austerlitz, but was in action against the Prussians the following year. Mm. There had already been signs that Ney's aggressive instinct, which made him a brilliant tactical leader, could also get him into trouble. Right. At the Battle of Jena, Ney ignored his orders and charged straight at the Prussian lines. Becoming cut off, his troops had to be rescued by Marshal Land's corps. A furious Napoleon remarked, Ney knows less about soldiering than the last joined drummer boy. And that... <laughs> You know, it's just a great Napoleon insult. We've got many of them, but that's exactly what I was saying. Uh, if you act independently and it goes well, hey, good on you. But if you act independently and you've made a stupid mistake, um, then you will see the wrath of Napoleon. Fortunately, Napoleon was talented enough that even if you made a stupid mistake, uh, he could, you know, work around it. But, you know, he would certainly not be happy at you. Ney was criticized again by Napoleon three months later, when his foraging raids into East Prussia appeared to provoke a Russian offensive. Hmm. The winter maneuvering culminated in the horrific Battle of Eylau, hmm. which Ney's corps reached only as darkness fell. That summer, Bennigsen's Russian army launched a surprise attack, hoping to encircle and destroy Ney's 6th Corps near Gutstadt. Ney, outnumbered four to one, conducted a brilliant fighting withdrawal and mm. escaped the trap. Nice. A week. I mean, that's impressive. Ney clearly is more interested in offense and attack, and yet, you know, that was a defensive maneuver that he conducted very successfully. So that that's impressive from him. Later. Also just impressive uh, in general that he managed to do that. Napoleon caught Bennigsen's army at Friedland. Mm -hmm. Ney led a crucial attack on the enemy. That man is a lion, said Napoleon, <laughs> watching his advance. Six That's a good descriptor, I think, of Ney. That man is a lion. He's ready to pounce, ready to strike at any moment. The corps' onslaught shattered the Russian left, leading to one of Napoleon's most decisive victories. Mm. For all his flaws, Ney had proved himself one of Napoleon's best tactical commanders. Clearly, and I mean, that's why Ney keeps getting important uh, positions and Napoleon keeps entrusting him, keeps trusting him, because despite the mistakes, which Napoleon gets very angry at, um, you know, Ney is an extremely valuable leader of men, you know? Um, when he does his job right, he does it very well. Um, like I said, and I, I mentioned this right at the beginning of this section, Suchet was extremely well-rounded. You know, he was good at any aspect of the job. Um, Ney is a little less well-rounded, um, but what he does leading these independent 
um, you know, cavalry strikes, he does very well. Um, though sometimes his, uh, you know, ambition, his desire to get in there and attack can get him in trouble. And was rewarded with the title Duke of Elkingham. In 1808, Ney commanded a corps during the invasion of Spain. He spent more than two years in the Iberian Peninsula, and like most of Napoleon's marshals, found it a bitter and frustrating experience. Yeah. In 1810, he joined Marshal Massena for the invasion of Portugal, but deeply resented being placed under his command. He mm. criticized every decision, helping to create a poisonous atmosphere at French headquarters. Yeah, I mean, that was not a good situation for anybody. Um, and I'm sure many of Ney's critiques were fair in one way or another, but it probably did not help uh, the morale <laughs> uh, of the officer corps. Uh, you know, this sort of toxicity going back and forth. The French advance on Lisbon came to a halt at the lines of Torres Vedras. During the subsequent retreat, Ney again demonstrated his brilliant tactical skills, mm. fighting a series of rearguard actions that kept Wellington's troops at bay. Nice. But Ney's fury at what he considered Massena's disastrous leadership boiled over into open insubordination. He was relieved uh -oh. of command and returned to France. I mean, it seems like Ney was often <laughs> on the verge of insubordination anyway, so put him in a situation like that. And I'm not surprised that uh, he was uh, outspoken about the faults he saw with Messina's uh, command. But he did not remain in disgrace for long. Okay. Napoleon knew Ney's worth in battle. Napoleon and needed the him. army adored him. He'd be needed in Russia and was recalled in 1812 with command of Third Corps. Mm. As the Kong d'Armée advanced deeper into Russia, Ney was always near the action, leading attacks at Krasny and at Smolensk, where he was wounded in the neck. Jeez. Amid the slaughter of Borodino, Ney led his corps in attack after attack on the Russian earthworks. When they were finally taken, and he was told that Napoleon would not send in his reserves to follow up their hard-won gains, he exploded with anger. What business has the Emperor in the rear of the army? Since he will no longer make war himself, let him return to the Tuileries and leave us to be generals for him. Tuileries Palace, the Royal Palace. Damn. That, I mean, you know, Napoleon's usually the one given the great insults, but, you know, I think uh, that's an equally good one from Ney. It was typical of Ney's lack of restraint. Yeah. But his blind faith in the Emperor did not survive Russia. Ooh, Henceforth, really? he'd fight only for France. It was during the retreat from Moscow that Ney ensured his place among the legends of military history. Mm. Just two weeks into the retreat, the Russians routed Davout's rear guard at Vyazma, and Ney and Third Corps took over. Yep. Ney was not only an instinctive tactician and apparently immune to fear or fatigue, I mean, I think there may not have been anyone better to put in this position. Like, Ney was lit like, clearly Ney has his faults, we've covered them, but he was, in this situation, perhaps the perfect man for the job. He could inspire or bully other men into superhuman feats of bravery and endurance. A French officer later recalled, I can see him still at the spot where the fighting was hottest, speaking to the men, indicating to the generals what positions they should take up, animating all hearts with the confidence that flashed from his glances. Mm. He made an effect on me I don't know how to describe. That's a great quotation. I really like that. From that, you can just tell that Ney must have been such a presence uh, seeing him in person. You can just imagine his energy, his charisma, you know, his ability to inspire those around him. I mean, what Napoleon needed from Ney, of course, was his uh, brilliant tactical mind. But more than that, someone who would never stop, who would always fight, and who could encourage those around him to do the same. 
you know, in this absolutely desperate situation. And like I said, I, I think Ney was literally the best man for the job. Now, the whole campaign in Russia went terribly and ended terribly, but, you know, I think Ney did as good as anybody could in that situation and probably prevented it from getting even worse. At Krasny, when the rear guard got cut off from the rest of the army, Ney angrily rejected calls to surrender and <laughs> led his men in an astonishing forced march across enemy territory, crossing Jeez. the frozen Dnieper River at night, personally pulling men from the river when they fell through the ice. Wow. Surrounded by Cossacks and down to 800 fighting men, they formed square and kept moving. Ney was more than a hero to the army. He was its talisman. Yeah. The news of his escape caused rejoicing throughout the army. Napoleon himself remarked, what a soldier. The army is full of brave men, but Michel Ney is truly the bravest of the brave. So true. I mean, we've seen a lot of brave, courageous men throughout the original series and Napoleon's Marshals, this series, but Ney really is at the top of the pack. Um, and it's, you know, it's so clear why he was a favorite of the army, why the troops loved him, why they, they looked up to him, they respected him, they trusted him. He was always in there, always fighting alongside them, um, succeeding, you know, he knew how to, you know, plan. He had that tactical mind, but he also knew how to lead. He knew how to get in there and fight and, you know, always be on the offense. So, it, you know, it's just so unsurprising that he was this uh, popular, beloved figure among the soldiers. Ney led the rear guard for the rest of the retreat, and according to legend, was the last man to cross the Nyman River into Poland. Mm. His leadership helped many thousands of soldiers to make it back alive. Yeah. Like I was saying, it was a terrible campaign, it ended terribly, but without Ney, uh, it may have gone even worse, which is, you know, shocking to think about, but perhaps true. Definitely true. Ney was rewarded with the title Prince of the Moskva and continued to serve throughout 1813, though his relations with the Emperor and Marshal Berthier in particular were increasingly strained. Mm. At Lützen, Ney was moved by the conduct of his young conscripts, who bore the brunt of Blücher's surprise attack, but fought back bravely, helping to win victory. Napoleon then entrusted Ney with command of three army corps, 84,000 men. But the plan for him to fall on the enemy's flank at Bautzen went awry. Badly drafted orders led to delay, and the coalition army was able to escape. Ooh. Ney fought in the Emperor's great victory at Dresden. But ten days later, at Denevitz, his limitations as an army commander were horribly exposed. Throwing himself into an attack, he lost control of the battle and was badly beaten by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Yeah, I mean, like we said, Ney is obviously not uh, perfect and, you know, he's also not a well-rounded marshal like Suchet was. He has some obvious faults and, you know, sometimes he can just get too wrapped up in things. You know, he can't take a step back and see that, you know, maybe I don't necessarily need to just keep moving forward. I need to do something else. Um, and, you know, someone like that will get into situations like these where he's just in over his head. But we, we've seen that sort of thing from a lot of marshals. I mean, Napoleon's marshals, a lot of them were these very brave, aggressive fighters because that's kind of how Napoleon was. You know, he was also very aggressive in style. Um... But a lot of them also have this issue where sometimes they can't tell when enough is enough. Um, and, and Ney seems to run into that problem as well. Ney was devastated by his defeat, but Napoleon kept him in command of his northern wing. Mm. At the gigantic four-day Battle of Leipzig, he commanded the northern sector, 
holding the line until a shoulder wound on the last day forced his return to France. He rejoined the army in 1814 and fought in the defence of France, commanding the Young Guard and personally leading a bayonet charge at the Battle of Montmirail. Of course. <laughs> in April, Ney, outspoken as ever, was among the first to confront Napoleon with the reality of his position mm. and force his abdication. Yeah, you know, we covered MacDonald in the last one, who was someone who would always speak his mind, would think for himself, and who was a principled man. I think Ney was more, you know, he couldn't help himself. <laughs> if he thought something, he could, he had to say it. Like, he could literally not restrain himself from saying what he thought, giving his opinion, and doing what he wanted. Um, I mean, that's how he was in his fighting style as well. You know, he, he couldn't help himself. He just had to go, go, go. And so, um, if Ney felt like, you know, he had to leave Napoleon behind, and that was the... Napoleon abdicating was the best thing to do for the sake of France, uh, it's unsurprising that he would let him know outright. That's just how he was. Ney was fated by the restored Bourbon monarchy as France's greatest soldier. Mm. But he could not hide his contempt for the returning aristocrats <laughs> who treated his family with disdain. When the king's niece reduced his wife to tears, Ney confronted her, shouting, I and others were fighting for France while you sat sipping tea in English gardens. Yeah. Stand up for your family. I, I, I fucking respect that. You know, uh, one, stand up for your family. Good job. And two, I mean, yeah, he's right. Like, obviously things got pretty out of control with the revolution and then Napoleon with his massive conquest of Europe. But, you know, the royals returning. At, at the time, people just wanted to return to stability. But very quickly, everyone got pretty, like, pissed at the royals again. Because, you know, they suck. So, I mean, I totally agree with the day here. Um, and yeah, I see where he's coming from. In February 1815, Napoleon escaped from exile on Elba and landed in France. Ney was horrified by the prospect of civil war mm. and promised the king that he'd bring Napoleon back to Paris in an iron cage. But he soon saw that the army was flocking to Napoleon's banner. When Napoleon appealed to him directly as the hero of Borodino, Ney made the fateful decision to cast in his lot with the Emperor. Wow. Yeah, that's got to be a really tough position to be in, you know, for Ney. You know, he doesn't want a civil war in France. You know, he wants his country to be safe, the people, you know, to be in a good condition. Um, he doesn't want this warfare. But, you know, he is a, a hero of the Napoleonic Wars. You know, he's one of the faces of the Grand Armée. He's one of its best representatives. So imagine the internal struggle that he would have had upon Napoleon returning. Um, and, you know, he's made the fateful decision to, uh, uh, to go back with Napoleon. Perhaps against his better judgment, I don't know. We don't know what exactly he was thinking, but it must have been a tough choice. I, I know that at least. Once more. When Napoleon advanced into the Netherlands in June to take on Wellington and Blücher's armies, Ney commanded his left wing. But he made a string of blunders. Against Wellington's troops at Quatre Bras, he was too cautious when he held the advantage. Two days later at Waterloo, Napoleon left much of the tactical handling of the battle to Marshal Ney. Mm. It was a mistake. Uh oh. <laughs> On his own initiative, Ney launched a series of mass cavalry attacks too of early. Of course, of course. And failed to launch any coordinated attacks on Wellington's position until... Yeah, I think Ney is another one of these guys who could act independently within limits. Given total freedom, he was prone to being far too aggressive. Given some limits to stay within uh, and the ability to make some independent decisions... Um, you know, he, he thrived in that atmosphere. Till late in the day. He had four horses killed under him. Jesus. And personally led the last doomed attack by the Imperial Guard. Though I will say, regardless of his mistakes, four horses killed under you. 
Can you, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know if I'd continue after the first horse were killed under me. Can you imagine you have four of your horses killed, you know, shot dead. You've almost been killed. You dropped to the ground, probably winded. And I imagine he's right back up on the horse leading the battle. Uh, he is a, clearly an extremely courageous man and a, a lot of energy there. But, you know, as we said earlier, it would be beneficial for him sometimes to take a, take a step back. Maybe after you get knocked off your horse, think, huh, sh should I keep doing this or maybe I should uh, pull back a little bit? <laughs> but re regardless, very brave. Ney's courage that day was awe-inspiring. Yeah. But his decisions helped to cause the French defeat. Yeah. yeah. In the aftermath, Ney spurned several chances to flee France and was arrested for treason by the restored monarchy. Yeah, he, do he doesn't seem like the type who would run away. He would uh, face his fate, I think. A military court refused to pass sentence. Wow. For his case. I mean, that that's, uh, you know... It makes sense, but it's sort of a nice moment, you know? He is one of the most beloved figures of the military, and, uh, you know, his contemporaries, a military court, even though he is, you know, he's a traitor to the monarchy, yeah, a traitor to the government, the royal government of France, but they still love him, I'm sure. You know, they're not willing to, uh, to betray him. Uh. He went to the Chamber of Peers. With the king's allies demanding that an example be made of Ney, oh. the outcome of his trial was never in doubt. Five of Ney's fellow marshals were among a large majority who voted for the death penalty. Jesus. On the 7th of December, 1815, he was marched into the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. Soldiers, when I give the order to fire, fire at the heart, he told the firing squad. Wait for the order, it will be my last to you. I protest against my condemnation. I have fought a hundred battles for France, but not one against her. Yeah, I mean, that seems like the way he would go out, you know, facing death right in the face, saying, you know what, fine, let's do this. I don't agree with it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it's a sad situation, especially as... You know, his, his comrades would uh, vote against him. Um, of course, it was a particular political situation, but, you know. And I understand, you know, he did commit treason, and uh, you you, under, you could understand why the royal government did it. They wanted to make an example out of him. Um, they wanted to prevent any other, uh, you know, insurgencies or resurgence of Napoleonic sentiment. I get that. But it is, uh, it's a pretty tragic way for him to go out, you know? You would uh, expect him to, to die fighting, you know? Die uh, leading a cavalry charge. Though, I guess he, he still died standing up for himself. So, you know, he, he, he did all he could. But it, it is a sad way for him to go out. Marshal Ney was among the most inspirational battlefield commanders in history. Mm. A born soldier and brilliant tactician. Unless his fiery temperament got the better of him. <laughs> yeah. He lacked the confidence for high command, but under the Emperor's supervision, he proved one of the Grand Armée's greatest combat leaders. Mm. Okay. Fantastic video so far. That segment on Ney might have been one of the, the best segments in this whole series. I particularly liked the retreat from Russia, sort of the personal anecdotes about him, really giving us a look at the man and how those around him saw him. You know, his, his energy, his charisma, his inspiring presence. That was really great. Um... Yeah, that, that was just an excellently produced segment. Um, and, yeah, I, I really liked Ney after that. You know, clearly a man with some faults. His, uh, his you know, uh, enthusiasm could get the better of him, but, you know, a super talented, brave, and inspirational guy that, uh, uh, you know, those around him and those under him, his soldiers, loved. Um, and you can see why. It's very clear. Um Anyway, into the, the last section of this video. Four. 
Marshal Soult. Soult. Wow. Jean de Dieu Soult was from a small town in southern France and enlisted in the Regiment Royal, mm. aged 16. He became a tough, capable sergeant and in the build up to the Revolutionary Wars, joined a new battalion of volunteers as their drill instructor. Soult's self confidence and bearing meant he was soon made an officer. The unit went into action against the Prussians in 1793. In a brutal baptism of fire, half the battalion became casualties, though Soult's own conduct was praised. Mm. After a spell on the staff of General Osh, he joined General Lefebvre's crack vanguard division. Soult learned much from Lefebvre, a future fellow marshal, yep. serving first as his chief of staff and later as his best brigade commander. Soult's rise from sergeant to brigadier general took less than three years. In the process, he won a reputation as an organized and decisive commander and brilliant tactician. He also began a bitter, long-lasting feud with another rising star, General Michel Ney. There he is again. <laughs> In 1799, Soult established himself as one of France's best divisional commanders, fighting under Massena's command at the Battle of Zurich. He was then put in charge of three divisions to pursue General Suvorov through the Alps, mm. proving his ability for high command. In his report to France's new first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, Massena wrote, For judgment and courage, Soult has scarcely a superior. Good qualities. The next year, Soult and Massena were besieged in Genoa. Soult led a series of daring raids on the Austrian lines. Until he was shot in the knee and captured, he was robbed and spent days in agony in a filthy <laughs> hospital. An Jeez. episode that may explain Soult's later reluctance to lead from the front. Okay, interesting. That, that, that's a tough situation. I mean, so far it seems like a talented and brave individual. I'm just sort of waiting to see what it is about Soult that makes him stand out. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> robbed after being injured. Yikes, that's rough. On his return to Paris, Soult received a hero's welcome from Napoleon. Nice. His rewards included an honorary rank as Colonel General in the Consular Guard, plus command of troops assembled at Saint-Omer for Napoleon's planned invasion of England. <laughs> Soult, the old drill instructor, imposed strict discipline and trained his men hard, earning the nickname Bras de Fer, Iron Arm. Ooh. Even Napoleon wondered if he was being too severe, to which Soult replied, those that can't handle what I myself endure will be left behind in the depots. Those that can will be fit to conquer the world. Okay, clearly a, a tough guy. Um, you know, there's a bit of a balance to be struck with this sort of harsh training um, between, you know, discipline and the respect of your men. Sometimes if you push too hard, your men will start to despise you. Um, but... If you push them hard, impose discipline, and then you go on to see success and victory, y your men will most likely think, you know what, it was worth it. <laughs> the training, that was worth it. So you just have to make sure that the discipline comes with, uh, you know, success, glory, honor, and that your men continue to respect you, and that they don't, you know, slowly <laughs> come to hate you for being too strict. Um... But, you know, Soult seems to have had a good head on his shoulders, so strict discipline, but uh, still a, a talented commander and uh, has and would see many victories. In 1804, Napoleon proclaimed his new empire and Soult received his marshal's baton. Nice. The next year, his impeccably drilled troops became Fourth Corps, the largest corps of the Grand Armée, mm. and marched east to take on the Third Coalition. That December, at Austerlitz, Napoleon entrusted Soult's corps with the main attack on the enemy centre. As he issued his final orders to his marshals, the Emperor turned to Soult last and said, As for you, Soult, I say only, act ha! as you always do. So, great quote. 
uh, always great quotes from Napoleon. We can see the level of trust uh, and respect that Napoleon clearly had uh, for Soult. You know, he relied on him and trusted him to do um, what he always did, to use his judgment. You know, clearly uh, Soult could be trusted to act somewhat independently. Fourth Corps' attack was the decisive blow of the battle, though its success owed much to Soult's exceptional divisional commanders, Saint-Hilaire mm. and Van Damme. With victory won, Napoleon acclaimed Soult the foremost manoeuvrer in Europe. Mm. However, it was observed that Soult was now less inclined to expose himself to enemy fire, taking a more managerial approach to command. Okay, though interesting. Planning, organization, and tactical instinct remained superb. I mean, and look, you could look down on that. I mean, it would probably be better to put yourself out there, but, you know, not everyone can be a nay. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that role is not for everybody. Um, and perhaps his prior experiences can explain that, or maybe he just thought, you know what, it's time for me to move it back a little bit. I don't know. But, you know, he still clearly is a man of sound judgment um, and uh, tactical brilliance, um, just maybe not one who wants to really put himself out there as much anymore. Um, and like I said, you know, uh, the actions that Ney took, well, only he could do that. But that level of sort of bravery and aggression, uh, it's not for everybody, and you can't expect it from everybody. So, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, look down on uh, Soult for that decision necessarily. Now, if it, uh, you know, hampers his ability to command, then that's a problem, you know? If it gets in the way of success, that's an issue. If not, then it's okay. The next year, Soult's corps played an important role at the Battle of Jena, and in the pursuit of the defeated Prussian army that followed. In the brutal winter battle at Eylau, his troops held the center of the line. Soult's relationship with Napoleon was excellent. Mm. The Emperor frequently turned to him for advice, much to Marshal Berthier's mm. annoyance. Mm. In 1808, Soult was ennobled as the Duke of Dalmatia, mm. and later that year led a corps in Napoleon's invasion of Spain. When the Emperor returned to France, he entrusted the pursuit of the British army to Marshal Soult. The British nicknamed Soult the Duke of Damnation, <laughs> and he harried them through the mountains of Galicia to La Coruña. But in battle, he could not break their lines, mm. nor prevent their escape by sea. Soult then marched south and occupied Porto, where rumours began that he was considering crowning himself King of Portugal. Uh -oh. Whether the rumours were serious or not, in May, the British and Portuguese took Soult by surprise and drove him out of Portugal with heavy loss in men and supplies. Mm. This was the most ignominious chapter of Soult's mixed record in the peninsula. Five years that saw sparks of brilliance, but also missed chances, shocking avarice, and a reluctance to cooperate with other commanders. Yeah, so, I mean, once again, almost nobody Suchet accepted, did well in the Iberian Peninsula, but um, uh, if what they just said was true, then it seems like Soult, you know, may have succeeded in some ways, but struggled particularly in other ways. Later in 1809, Soult replaced Marshal Jourdan as King Joseph's chief military advisor, and led French forces to a crushing victory over the Spanish at Ocaña. He then oversaw the French occupation of southern Spain. Mm. Appointed governor of Andalusia, Soult administered the region with cold efficiency from his headquarters at Seville, though avoiding harsh measures where possible. He lived in royal style and notoriously looted Spanish churches yeah. on such a scale that he soon amassed one of the great art collections in Europe, worth an estimated 1.5 million francs. Yeah. I mean, I remember this, uh, 250 million dollars, uh, of looted art, you know, that just because you can take stuff doesn't mean that you should take it. I mean, one, 
you're not going to ingratiate yourself with the locals. <laughs> they already hate you. Um, but as we saw with Suchet, you can make them hate you less, or even like you. Um, and Sult, you are doing nothing to help your cause. Um, two, you know, it's just fucked up, man. <laughs> like, why don't you leave the art where it is, you know? Stop looting churches, you know? Uh, <laughs> let the churches keep their stuff, and, you know, let, let the people, uh, of the country keep their art and, uh, their goods. Uh, you know, so, this is sort of showing the bad side of Sult's personality, I suppose. Um... Uh, it seems like just pure greed, to be honest. So that's a uh, pretty unbecoming uh, quality. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, not great, not great. He was increasingly aloof, mm. and even his aides found him difficult to like. Salt's character is hard and above all egotistical, one wrote. He takes no more than a passing interest in those around him. Yeah, so that's not great. And, you know, I talked about just earlier how him removing himself from the front line it's not necessarily an issue if it doesn't affect your performance but that move seems to have been representative of a more general change in his personality becoming more aloof you know i'm sure seeing himself as superior to those around him um you know this is overall a negative change that's going to make you harder to work with it's going to make it harder to lead if you can't understand the people around you um, and they can't understand you. Um, not a good situation to be in, but, you know, this is what happens for a lot of people when they get into positions of power, particularly positions of independent power. You know, Sult has been left basically to his own devices, um, and it seems to have kind of gone to his head. You know, we have some men like Ney, who, regardless of the position he was put in, always wanted to do the same thing, which was lead his men. Or some men like MacDonald, who, regardless of the power he amassed, would always think for himself and speak his mind. But for a lot of people, they can't keep their head when they get this level of power and influence. Uh, and it uh, seems to be affecting Sult, definitely. In 1811, with Marshal Massena's army stalled outside Lisbon, Napoleon ordered Soult to give support. Mm. Like many of Napoleon's long-range interventions in Spain, the objectives were unrealistic. Right. Yet Soult marched north with 20,000 men, capturing Badajoz, but withdrew on receiving news of an enemy landing near Barossa. Mm. Two months later, he marched north again to relieve Badajoz, now besieged by the enemy and met Beresford's larger army en route at Albuera. Salt launched a flanking attack that threw the enemy into confusion, but he failed to follow up his advantage and left the tactical handling of the battle to others. Nor was he on the spot to inspire his troops, and mm. his army suffered a bloody defeat. Yeah, so, you know, there's clearly still talent there, you know, clearly... Uh, he still has skills in planning and strategy, but his inability to lead his men to be there on the ground, to act quickly um, because of his absence, is now really getting in the way of his success. Um, maybe he'll turn it around, but uh, I have to say I'm really surprised that he's the highest ranked marshal in this video with uh, you know what we've been seeing uh, at this point. The next year, Wellington's victory at Salamanca forced Soult to abandon his palace in Seville and retreat to Valencia. Though that autumn, he had the satisfaction of reoccupying <laughs> Madrid and pursuing Wellington's army back to the Portuguese frontier. Yeah. In 1813, Napoleon summoned Soult to Germany, where he fought at Lutzen and supervised the main attack at Bautzen. Mm. But when news arrived of the calamitous French defeat at Vitoria, Napoleon sent Soult back to Spain to take charge. Soult inherited a demoralized, disorganized army. He quickly imposed order, turned it around, and attacked. I mean, hey, you know, like I said, he's still got a lot of talent, you know? He's still 
the disciplinarian, you know, which in this case is very effective, though this is overall just a terrible situation for the French to be in. It was an impressive feat, but his mostly young conscripts were up against experienced, well-led troops. Mm. Two attempts to relieve the besieged garrison of San Sebastian failed. Soult began a fighting retreat through the Pyrenees mountains back to France. Despite the limitations of his demoralized conscripts, he ensured Wellington's army had to fight every step of the way. So, I mean, this, so far, Soult has had a rather mixed record, but uh, this is one of the more positive parts, you know, despite the fact that he is retreating and his army's in a terrible situation, you know, he's uh, trying and he's doing a pretty good job of attempting to salvage an impossible situation. Now, he's not going to fix the situation. It's kind of impossible at this point, um, unless Napoleon wants to bring the entire Grand Armée over, which he can't. But, you know, he is, you know, succeeding uh, in some ways. You know, he's making Wellington fight for every inch of territory. He's reimposing order. Uh, perhaps raising morale a, a bit, maybe. Um, so, you know, he's making a good effort, uh, even though the situation is really not salvageable. Um, so this is a, a credit to his career, where, you know, his time in Spain has been quite mixed overall. <laughs> Counterattacking whenever possible, and offering resistance till the end. Nice. Even as Napoleon's empire began to collapse. The last battle of the campaign was fought at Toulouse, a bloody and unnecessary one, as Napoleon had abdicated four days earlier. Ooh. Under the Bourbon Restoration, Soult became an unpopular Minister of War. Yeah. Like Marshal Ney. I'm not surprised. Well, the unpopular part is the part that doesn't surprise me, just because, you know, from his time in the army, he kind of became this aloof disciplinarian who didn't really seem to respect the people around him and so you could imagine that type of character as uh, a government minister aloof you know aloof from the populace doesn't really care so you know that uh, transition does make some sense and i can understand why he'd be unpopular hey, he initially opposed napoleon's return from exile mm. but saw which way the wind was blowing and rallied to the emperor Napoleon made several dubious appointments in 1815. One was to pick Soult as his new chief of staff, mm. replacing Marshal Berthier. Not only did this waste Soult's command abilities, since his new role was merely to implement Napoleon's orders, Soult also inherited a complex staff system of Berthier's own devising. Crucial errors resulted during the Waterloo campaign, with orders going astray and commanders unsure of their role. Soult's warning not to underestimate Wellington's army was dismissed by Napoleon. Ooh. You think that because Wellington defeated you, he must be a great general. I tell you that he is a bad general, that the English are bad troops, and this will be over by lunchtime. Ah, uh, that's very interesting. You know, Napoleon says that to Soult because, you know, he thinks that Soult is so full of himself that Soult's thinking, oh, well, he defeated me, he's going to defeat you. Uh, and Napoleon's like, get, get your head out your ass. Like, w you know, we've got this. But, you know, it happens that Napoleon was the one who was full of himself, not Soult. Um, you know, very interesting. Um, you know, I, I can't necessarily blame him for thinking that, you know, what we've heard of Soult so far. But, of course, in this situation, Napoleon was uh, very wrong. Following Napoleon's defeat, Soult lived in exile until 1819, mm. then returned to France under a political amnesty. After the July Revolution, he served as a reforming Minister of War, and three times as President of the Council of Ministers, effectively France's Prime Minister. Hmm. He also became the Grand Old Man of the French Army, elevated to Commander-in-Chief with the exalted rank of Marshal General of France. Wow. 
So quite a successful and prestigious political career following his military career. I wonder how the people viewed him in the years following his return. Um, Because, you know, in 1814, with his political appointment, he was rather unpopular. Um, I wonder if that, you know, if that changed with uh, the rest of his career. Soult died aged 82 in the same town where he was born. Wow. And today, as saint amand Soult. Hmm. Soult's record as a marshal was mixed. A brilliant and intelligent organiser, whose ability to deliver a master stroke or inspire his troops to victory waned with time. Right. Yet he was one of the few marshals that Napoleon could trust with a large independent command. A quality he needed desperately, but found in short supply. Suchet, Ney, Soult. Join us for the final part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top three coming <laughs> soon. Oh my. Brand new to the Epic History TV store. <laughs> uh, anime versions of the Marshals. Um, all right. Well, I'm very excited to get to the last episode. Um, this was a fantastic one, particularly the segment on Ney. Um, I'm kind of surprised that Soult was the highest ranked among this bunch. Um, I felt like Suchet was generally more successful, but, and I think they kind of explained why, uh, it seems that, you know, Soult had, you know, perhaps more important positions and more independent commands of importance, basically. You know, Soult, um you know, was sort of the one, like, overall in charge in Spain at one point. You know, he led several uh, important missions there, whereas Suchet kind of had his own little corner. Um, so I, I think that's why, despite his mixed record, Soult was ranked higher, um, because he had more important positions, more important responsibilities, um, and he acted... Uh, more independently as well. Um, though I'd be interested to hear from you guys if you uh, agree with that ranking, where you think Sult should be placed, uh, higher, lower, uh, or if you think they, they ranked it correctly. Um, but regardless, this was a fantastic video. This whole series has been fantastic. Uh, you know, this one in particular, I really enjoyed, and I'm really excited to get into uh, the last episode in this series. I'm a little sad that it's ending, because it's been so good, um, but I'm also excited. So if you guys enjoyed this reaction, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, uh, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. I hope all you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.